OK, um, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll hopefully have a couple more people joining us on the call as we progress. I know that technology isn't always the best thing to work for everybody, so hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, it's nice to see you all here for our breakout session as part of the 2020 Virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Um, my name is Kevin Dooley. I'm the Head of Marketing for Rutherford Health, and I'd like to thank the Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Charity for inviting us here today to talk to you, and specifically thank you to Chris and Sharon for all their help in setting up and, and working with Rutherford over the last year or so. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of quick house rules. Everyone should already be muted. Um, however, if you are for any reason unmuted, could you try and go on mute during the talk just so everyone can hear Carol clearly? Could I also ask that any questions are kept until the end? However, if you'd like to ask a question at any point, you can do so via the chat box, which is almost like a little speech bubble in the top of the Microsoft Teams window. And then I'll take a record of those questions and hold them till the end. And if at the end you'd like to ask a question, there's a hand button, which is right near the top, which you can also press and we'll try and get around everybody that we can. Just to make you all aware that the session is also being recorded on um, so if you'd rather not have your image recorded, then I would turn off your camera. Um, so our speaker today is Professor Carol Sikora, who you should be able to see spotlighted on the screen. Um, he's Chief Medical Officer for Rutherford Health, and he'll be talking today about the challenge of head and neck cancer. Carol is one of the founders of Rutherford Health, one of the co-founders, I should say, and we were the first to treat with proton therapy here in the UK in 2018 at our network of Rutherford Cancer Centres. And in fact, the first patient to receive proton therapy here in the UK, a gentleman by the name of Simon Hardacre, he spoke at this conference last year in Brighton, sharing his thoughts and his experiences. Carol has over 50 years experience as a leading oncologist, and he's regularly invited by the media to give an expert view on cancer related stories, as well as being the former chief of the World Health Organization's Cancer Programme. So Carol, over to you. Thank you very much. It's it's great to be here with you. I'm really sorry we're not doing it in person. That's my only uh, concern. So head and neck cancer. You know, I used to run the head and neck clinic at Hammersmith and uh, jointly with St. Mary's who provided the surgery. And it was a real challenge and it continues to be a real challenge. Challenge for everybody, for the patients firstly, for their families, for the doctors, the other clinical staff, those services that we forget about, speech therapy, uh, nutrition services, and so on. And it's a real challenge for a variety of reasons. The first problem is it's not one disease. So we lump everything together and say head and neck cancer, by which we don't mean the brain, that's excluded. And we don't mean the top of the lung, that's also excluded. But we actually think of everything in between those two, the brain and the lung. Now, the problem in between is the anatomy. Now, I, I was one of the generation of medical students that had to dissect the human body and you, you had to do different bits at a time uh, when I was a first year medical student. And then you had to get it signed up that you understood where all the nerves come from. It's all done on a computer now. It's all a lot simpler and less smelly. But we learned quite a lot by doing that. And there's no doubt the most complex bits of anatomy are in the head and neck, the relationships of all the structures. Uh, and as you'll see, as I talk about the treatment of head and neck cancer, that anatomy is of profound importance in getting good results with whatever treatment one's doing. So the first thing about head and neck cancer, it's different from the common cancers. The four common cancers are breast, lung, colon and prostate. And in, in these, there's a single organ involved. And there's fairly, there's roots of spread that we understand and we can work out quite clearly a staging system which carries a prognosis. So if we take a breast cancer, starts a small tumour in the breast, moving to a small tumour in the breast and perhaps axillary nose, lymph nodes in the armpit, and then moving on to metastases, spread of the cancer elsewhere. With head and neck, it's a bit more complex than that but it's all based on the anatomy being extremely complicated. The second thing is that the histology, that's what the tumors are composed of, differs. There's two main types, squamous cell, which are the lining cells of epithelia. The skin cells are, are squamous cells. They produce various proteins 
that protect us from the outside world and cells inside the body do exactly the same. So the squamous cells, then there's also glandular cells and that's called adenocarcinoma. And if you take certain structures, you can have adenocarcinomas and you can have squamous carcinomas and that's, that's part of the problem. Not everyone has the same tumor. On top of that, we have various grading systems, as we call it, to grade the tumor. Some tumors retain the differentiation state of the tissue from which they arrived, uh, arise. Say parotid gland, for example, it looks, the cells look like a parotid gland in a well-differentiated tumor. And on the whole, well-differentiated tumors have a better prognosis than poorly differentiated tumors because in poorly differentiated tumors, the cells are streamlined for growth. They've shod all the machinery that makes them look nice in terms of the function they have of the primary organ. They're just streamlined to divide and go. Uh, and that's part of the trouble. <clears throat> the head and neck cancer, the three main treatments which we know are surgery, radiotherapy, and then systemic therapy. And we've seen advances in all three, tremendous advances. The problem is how to decide which treatment, and if we're using combination treatment, which sequence of treatments to give in an individual patient. And that is part of the trouble. It's coming together in a multidisciplinary manner to try and optimize the care for a single patient. And that depends on having good information. Quite often I get asked, usually by my wife, and she says, could you, oh, so-and-so's mother has got cancer, could you, could you help? And you, you get some, you know, I phone up her friend and you get some sort of third-hand story. It, it's no good, you can't do medicine like that. And we, we have almost rows about that sort of consultation. I said, the only way, especially in something as complicated as head and neck cancer, is to get the histology report, that's the, the report from the biopsy, which shows a description of the cells. That's one thing you need. And second thing you need is the imaging. Now, we're so fortunate now compared to when I began in oncology, uh, the imaging we have in this very complex area of the body is fantastic, whether it's CT scans, MR scans, PET CT, they all tell us slightly different bits of information and they're all very valuable in us to work out what the state of the tumour is and come up with a plan that's the best we can do for that patient. So those investigations, a biopsy that's simple, you have to get a biopsy somehow and we've got all sorts of ways of getting very good quality biopsies by using a combination of imaging and needles from the outside, needle biopsies of lymph nodes, of tissue of the larynx, of the oropharynx, uh, sometimes just under local anesthetic. It's all perfectly possible to do that. We get good information and then the imaging. And really normal chest, normal x-rays, including chest x-ray, don't have much role to play. It's CT scan and MRI scan. I remember when I was a registrar and it was a defining moment. It was like when Kennedy died. You remember where you were standing when you heard that. When I saw my first CT scan, I can remember the very room, the very box, the x-ray box that I put the scan up. This was 1974. I was a registrar at Cambridge and suddenly there was an image that I'd never seen before. How could you see the internal anatomy? And it was a head and neck patient. How could you see the internal anatomy of the oropharynx up there on the box as you've never seen it before? In the past, before that, the images were bits of barium going down and uh, this sort of thing, and you've got messy images. You really couldn't see the three-dimensional anatomy. We've come a long way since 1974 when I was a registrar. We're now in a much, much different world where images are fantastic. And not only that, they can be trans transmitted down the line instantly. So if you have an x-ray tomorrow in, in a hospital in Yeovil, I can see it at Hammersmith or in the Rutherford at the same time, almost the same time as it goes up locally with the appropriate security code. So it's fantastic. And the NHS, the IT systems in the NHS are poor. We all acknowledge that, despite a lot of money being spent on them. Having said that, the IT of imaging is fantastic. 
And that's because the image companies, Philips, and Siemens, and so on, uh, have put a lot of effort into making sure their images are transmittable and comparable. So biopsy and imaging are the key components to moving forward. So then we've got the three modalities of treatment, and maybe I should just mention a bit about each of them and then how we decide what to do. Uh, and so if we take surgery first, I'm not a surgeon, and uh, I think surgery has a major role in head and neck cancer. Not for all tumours. For example, the larynx is definitely the voice box. is best treated when it can be by radiotherapy. But surgery has a major role for most other cancers to remove the primary tumour, to understand how far it's spread in the patient. So the biopsy gives us a certain amount of data, but it doesn't tell us the three-dimensional anatomy of the cancer and how far it's spread within the different organs in the head and neck area. So getting surgery from a skilled surgeon, working usually with plastic surgeons and dental surgeons, because it's not just getting the tumour out, it's how to reconstruct uh, the area as best as possible. Now, I know some of you have had very extensive operations in the head and neck region. Uh, the most extensive being the removal of the, the mandible, the lower jaw, and, uh, uh, and reconstruction often with an implant of, of metal somewhere to keep the structure going. Uh, these are very skilled operations, very tricky operations. And it's clear that to get good quality of life, you have to have quite extensive surgery, but extensive reconstruction with plastics. And again, that whole area, which is not my field, has really gone leaps and bounds over the last decade. The technology is there, just as the technology of dentistry has changed dramatically, mainly because of materials. The whole implantation business, which is used, you can get implants in the high street now, but the implants used in head and neck surgery are much more sophisticated and, and require detailed planning to get optimal results. The other thing about surgery, it's inevitably destructive. By definition, you're removing part of the body and the aim is to remove as little as possible of the body, hopefully all the cancer, whilst maintaining, uh, despite you removing just a small amount of material, you want to include all the cancer. Because we've got such good imaging now, we know the boundaries of the cancer before surgery is performed. So surgery is a much more planned procedure than it used to be when I started in oncology. So that's surgery. The second modality is radiotherapy. And for certain parts in the head and neck region, radiotherapy is curative. So tonsil cancers localized to the tonsil, laryngeal cancers, the voice box, absolutely so. Larynx cancer has a 90% chance of being cured when it's T1, the early stage. And the reason for that is that hoarse voice is a symptom that comes pretty early. You get a little nodule on, on, on the vocal cord. That's usually where laryngeal cancer starts. Little nodule. And it, change, it changes the tone of your voice. You can hear it and you can hear it in people. And so sometimes it bleeds a bit. So the combination of a hoarse voice that's progressive and doesn't improve and any sort of coughing up blood or spitting up blood alerts people and they go to the doctor. And on the whole, they're picked up early in the early stage with a really good prognosis. And the best treatment for that is not surgery, but radiotherapy. And the reason for that is that surgery, removing the voice box inevitably means uh, you're stuck with no voice box for many, obviously, for the rest of your life. With radiotherapy, although there may be changes in tone and the perception of that tone, it gradually gets better. And uh, some of you may have had radiotherapy for laryngeal cancer. And it's, it's really a very effective modality. And we can be very precise about how we deliver it. So radiotherapy, the art of good radiotherapy is to, just like surgery, to deliver as high a dose as possible to the cancer while sparing critical normal tissues. And if you actually think of the head and neck structures, there are a lot of structures there that are pretty sensitive to radiation and some that are not so sensitive. 
So, uh, for example, we've got bone. That's not sensitive to radiation. You can radiate for a very high dose and bone on the whole withstands radiotherapy. But spinal cord does not. And of course, near the brain stem, which is the bit of the spinal cord right at the top, as it comes out of the brain, joins the spinal cord at the very top of the neck, uh, the first cervical vertebrae, the second cervical vertebrae, and then goes down the body, uh, down the, the spinal column. The top part, and as you enter the base of the brain, is extremely sensitive to radiation. And the dose we have used for, say, a squamous cell cancer that's invaded the base of the brain is higher than the dose tolerance of normal, uh, normal uh, brainstem structure, the nerves in the brainstem. That's a problem. We don't really understand why there is such differential sensitivity in nerve tissue in different parts of the body, but the brainstem is particularly sensitive. The other area that's very sensitive as you go higher up into the, into the not quite into the brain, but at the base of the brain, is the optic chiasm. That's where the nerves come out of the, uh, of the brain and then cross over to go to uh, the retina in the eye. And that's an area where if you give more than a certain dose, you damage the optic chiasm nerves uh, and it crosses over. So what you see from the, the, with your left eye, uh, it, it's your right brain that's seeing from that. There's a crossover uh, and you, you don't perceive all this, but it's uh, I, I can assure you it crosses over. And the structure where it crosses over is particularly sensitive. And then there's other things, there's the pituitary gland that produces hormones. If you radiate that, then you damage the production of, of hormones and you can have problems if it's not recognized. Uh, then obviously you've got blood vessels, but they're fine. They, they tend not to be so radiosensitive. And then as you go down, you've got the tissues of the mouth and the back of the tongue and so on, the mucous membranes, and they're sensitive and they cause the side effects that we're familiar with with radiotherapy. The one thing I've seen really improve, the two things I've seen really improve with radiotherapy over my career is number one, the precision at which it can be given. That's number one. And number two is the team effort to make the journey through a course of radiotherapy much, much more pleasant than it was 30 years ago. So now a whole team of experts, nurses, nutritionists and so on, help patients to deal with mouth care um, one can prevent a lot of the terrible side effects people get into with infection, with fungal infections, with mucositis, which is inflammation of the mucous membranes. So sometimes people have to be admitted to hospital because they can't drink because their, their mouth is so painful because they've got radiation mucositis. And we can deal with that prophylactically, we can prevent it now and anticipate it coming. So a journey through radiotherapy in the year 2020 for head and neck cancer is a lot uh, less troublesome than it would have been in, in, in 19, 1990 or somewhere like that. So radiotherapy is getting better. Uh, the other thing about radiotherapy, I have to mention protons or Kevin won't, uh, will shoot me. I'll never appear again at a meeting. Uh, basically, uh, there's no doubt what we've seen in radiotherapy is a revolution in information technology. You know, I began, I learned radiotherapy with no computer. It was all done by hand planning. And you can't really do a very good job in the, the complex area of head and neck without a CT scan and without a computer. You end up getting an approximation of where you want to get the radiation. And that leads to long-term side effects and deterioration in quality of life. Now we have fantastic information technology. And so the first thing to do is to look at the scan and to outline the tumor. That's the first thing. This is the area we think the tumor is. That's, that's called the, the planned treatment volume. We then go ahead and work out a clinical treatment volume, which includes areas where we know from our knowledge and literature that the tumor is likely to spread. So we want to reduce the risk of the tumor spreading to that area right from the start. And so that's why we outline it with an extension of long routes of spread. And then we have the, the, the computer calculates the optimal plan. It notes where normal tissues that are critical to radiation, like the spinal cord, 
the, the mucous membranes, the salivary glands, where they're all sitting, and works out the best plan to avoid those and yet to give the primary tumor the best dose possible. And, you know, a computer can do several hundred thousand plans in a few seconds. A human could take, I used to, when, without the computer, it took me two or three hours to do a single plan. You learn the rules and so you could optimize it so you could get avoid certain structures and make sure the tumor got a high dose. But the computer is far more sophisticated. And not only that, various technologies have come in. Uh, in the old days, it was two or three fields meeting at a certain point. Now we use intensity modulated radiotherapy, IMRT, and uh, imaging uh, at the time before radiotherapy. So radiotherapy has really moved on. We also have things like ARC therapy, VMAT it's called, um, volume modulated ARC therapy. And there's all sorts of other technical in innovations, but the, the biggest innovation is connecting the very sophisticated imaging that improves every year that we have now CT and MRI, and to the radiotherapy. So you know that you're delivering where you want to do it. And we're seeing advances there. The advances come with the MR LINAC, where instead of just having a linear accelerator that is planned and off you go, you do an MR image on the same machine through the same lens as the radiotherapy is going to be delivered before you deliver the radiotherapy. And the MR LINAC is perhaps one of the, it, it sounds, uh, well, obvious to do that. It, it, technically, it's very difficult to have a magnetic resonance machine in the same room as a linear accelerator. They don't get on with each other. It's like having a dog and a cat in a, in, in a room together that hate each other. They hate each other because technically uh, they interfere with each other's function. And so uh, that's been achieved now. And there are several in the UK, both in the NHS and the private sector. We've got one up in Liverpool. And uh, there's no doubt for head and neck cancer they're going to be a dramatic improvement. So uh, protons, another dramatic improvement in terms of how they deposit dose. The, the protons are an old discovery, Ernest Rutherford, that's why we're called the Rutherford, in 1917 during World War I in Cambridge, discovered protons. These are particles, they're par nuclear particles, there's protons, there's neutrons, there's electrons. Protons can be accelerated, usually in a cyclotron, to nearly the speed of light. And when they come out, they deliver their radiation in a different way than a linear accelerator. Uh, it's the same radiation. It has the same biological effect. There's nothing special about proton radiotherapy. What's special is that protons stop in tissue. We call it the Bragg peak. They go into tissue and then they stop at a defined point. And you can define where they stop by the energy you deliver them with. So you can actually, if you take the head and neck region, you want to deliver a dose to a parotid gland, you can shoot it into the parotid gland and make sure that when the protons come out of the parotid gland, there's nothing, no energy coming out. They've stopped all within the gland that you want them to stop. With a linear accelerator, there's always an exit dose. So if I shoot a, uh, a linear accelerator beam into Kevin, it'll come out the other side. If we shoot protons into Kevin, it won't come out the other side, it stops. Now you can imagine with the computer, computer power that we have, we can have a combination, a serious combination of uh, beams that allow us to optimize the localization of the radiation around a cancer while sparing the normal tissue. It's all about this selective destruction, selective dosing to cancer, sparing the normal tissue. And protons are just one of the armamentarians for the So we've got protons, we've got MR Linux, uh, and obviously the increased quality of the imaging. I can't leave the imaging without talking about PET scanning. PET scanning is really important. It's called positron emission tomography. And PET scanning has been around quite a long time, but now it's routine. It's routine for head and neck cancer. And all it is, it's very simple. You take a, a sugar isotope, a labeled sugar with a little radioactive tag on it, and then you scan the patient to see where the sugar is after two or three hours. And if you have cancer and the cancer is active, the tag 
the sugar molecule is avidly taken in and not let out by the cancer cells. You think of them as gobbling up the sugar. And uh, they, they retain the, the, the radioactivity that you can detect with a scanner, and therefore you can look at hot spots. They're very easy to interpret. I mean, you know, a lot of images, especially MRI, especially if the head and neck region are very difficult to interpret, and it's a skilled job. But PET scans, even I can look at. Even you, anybody could look at it. You just see hot spots. It's like a bone scan. You see these spots around, and the hot spots are where this active. There's a few problems. Um, sometimes the bladder shines. Sometimes the kidneys shine uh, non-specifically with breakdown of the, the isotope sugar. And, and sometimes you, inflammation can show it. So someone with bad sciatica and an inflamed nerve down at the bottom of the spine, you can see a hot spot there. But on the whole, it's a very powerful analysis to see if there's functional activity of a cancer rather than just a shadow that represents a healed cancer that's burnt itself out. So the combination of imaging and radiotherapy is really extremely powerful. Now, moving on from radiotherapy, the third modality is systemic treatment. We now call it SAC, systemic anti-cancer treatment. And it's, a, it's only in Britain that they call it that, but that's what we do everywhere you see SAC sweet and so on. And we used to call it chemo sweet. So why is it changed? It changed because of immunotherapy. And of course, immunotherapy has a big role to play in squamous head and neck cancer now and is being used widely in Britain and elsewhere for it. So uh, basically, chemotherapy, traditional chemotherapy is used in different ways. It's used prior to any further treatment, we call that neoadjuvant chemotherapy, where it's given before any treatment that's planned. So you would have maybe six cycles or four cycles of chemotherapy, followed by surgery, followed by radiotherapy, and then maybe two or three cycles afterwards. Chemotherapy can be given to reduce the size of the cancer prior to another curative treatment. It can also be given after surgery or radiotherapy on the basis it's reducing the risk of the disease coming back. And then of course it can be used if the disease has come back and you give it to follow, to, to, to reduce the, 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 the size of metastasis. Uh, that is sort of, uh, once one has metastasis, one just monitors what's going on. And it, it's, it's really so important in that situation to monitor with scans or other measurements, what is really going on. There's no point giving lots of chemotherapy if it's not working. You need to either carry on with something different or stop because you're doing no good. And that is something we do regularly now. So chemotherapy, neoadjuvant, adjuvant, and then for metastatic disease. Unfortunately for most head and neck cancer, it's partially effective. And I've seen some fantastic responses in patients with traditional drugs. The, the two traditional drugs, one is 5-fluorouracil, the other is cisplatin. It's sister uh, carboplatin may also be used. Very powerful drugs. They have side effects, and that's part of the problem. And then after that, uh, there are a variety of other drugs that are being used. More recently, we've seen the advent of molecular therapies, drugs often oral, that target very specific molecular abnormalities. And this has required a new way of thinking. Rather than just giving uh, drugs like platinum and 5-FU to everybody, what we have to do is to take the biopsy material and actually work out for that patient which is the best drug. What molecular abnormalities are there in the cancer that should lead to the better choice of drug because the drugs hit specific molecular abnormalities. They're just not going to work if the patient doesn't express in the cancer one of those abnormalities. And then um, after that, we've had immunotherapy, which to me is a great surprise. You know, a long time ago, I did a PhD in tumor immunology. So I know a bit about it, but it's all a bit dated now. But the great thing is that we were really surprised. And it all started in about 2011, 2012. People started doing immunotherapy studies with drugs that took the brakes off the immune system. 
we've known for years there's an immune response to cancer. We, once you get a cancer, there's an immune response. But the cancer cells are clever. They develop all sorts of ways of escaping destruction by the immune response, uh, sending out factors to suppress local cells, T cells and other cells from getting in. We all know about T cells. It's in the papers today because of COVID, of course. But these same T cells are very good for surveying for cancer and doing something about it. Um, there may be a normal defense mechanism, immunosurveillance, where the cells are in there looking for head and neck cells that are deviating and destroy them before they cause any trouble. And what we've seen, which is fantastic, there were lots of experiments in the early part of uh, this decade looking at how you could immunize patients to their own cancer. This was complex. You'd have to take material, get, make a vaccine individually for them and then give it back to them. It was complex, expensive, cumbersome and took time. And cancer patients, as we know, don't have a lot of time to have a specific personalized vaccine made for them. It's just too complicated. So now along comes uh, some drugs that are called uh, the, 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 the drugs that take the breaks off the immune system, such as nivolumab, pertuzumab, uh, then uh, ipilimumab. They've all got great names and they're all monoclonal antibodies and they basically t attach themselves to lymphocytes, the, the white cells, and s s allow them to, to, to run riot. And interesting for those of you that have had these drugs, you know that the side effects are those of lymphocytes running riot with your own body, what we call autoimmunity. Lymphocytes are actually trying to target uh, some of the tissues of the body and membranes and the endocrine glands and so on. I have a friend of mine that's had uh, nivolumab for nearly two years and he's completely out of hormones. His pituitary, his adrenal glands have all been inflamed and he's on a whole range of hormone treatments. And that's one of the side effects when you take the breaks off the immune system. Uh, but it is effective. And the other thing that we don't understand is how long is the, are the effectiveness is the effectiveness of immunotherapy going to go on for? Because it's too young. We only used started using it in squamous head and neck cancer and squamous lung cancers uh, in around 2017, 2018, outside of clinical trials. So it'll take several years. We really know what how valuable it is at prolonging life and prolonging quality of life in people with head and neck cancer. But it was a great surprise, uh, a really great surprise that it worked so effectively. We still don't really know the duration of immunotherapy. We think it's 24 months, two years of the current protocols, but we don't know. It could be less in some patients and more in others. And obviously, we're desperate to try and find markers to predict who to give immunotherapy to, who to give for a long period of time. And again, it's caught the era of personalized medicine, the idea that we can personalize treatment for an individual patient, even working out how many cycles of immunotherapy. So if we give it for 24 months on a protocol, there must be some patients um, that maybe six months would be enough, and others that would benefit from maybe five years. But we want to know for the patient in front of us what they would really be optimal at, because nothing has no side effects. Everything we use in oncology has side effects, some of them, as you know, quite profound. So what about the future? So radiotherapy, surgery, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, they'll, they'll all be part of the future. The biggest part of the future that I can see is this personalization. The idea that, you know, 100 people with oropharyngeal cancer, the oropharynx is the bit at the back of the mouth, basically, the back of the tongue, uh, squamous cell, all with the same type, of, exactly the same, exactly the same stage. There may be 100 different treatments, optimizing it for the individual. Some will just have surgery, others will have chemotherapy prior to surgery, others will be put straight onto immunotherapy, others will have radiotherapy, some with protons, some with an MR linac. It's all this personalization that's going to be the future. And the next generation of oncologists are going to have to bring the patient into the equation. You know, it, it, there are risks. I mean, it's like all this business of COVID and risks, the vulnerable groups, shield or not to shield and so on. 
you know, once you step out of your house or even in your house and a passing aeroplane could drop its engine on my house now as I speak, I hope it won't because otherwise we won't be able to have any questions. But that does happen now and again. It's very, very low risk. And so it's the same with trying to work out a treatment plan for a complex head and neck cancer. Treatment has risks. No treatment also has risks. And it's all about mitigating both sides and coming to a, a reasonable personalized plan. <clears throat> and that's where the multidisciplinary team comes in, because that can help to see in assessing you different skills, different impressions and different assessments, including nutrition, speech therapy, dental and so on. These are all vital in coming to a conclusion to how best to personalize treatment. So. The future is more of that, but it's also more guidance. At the moment, we learn very little from the biopsy other than the things I've said. In 10 years time, the whole sequence, the whole DNA sequence of that biopsy, the whole DNA sequence of you will be printed out together and far more sophisticated guidelines will come for you and your treatment to try and work out how uh, to optimize care in timing, in dose, in amount, and in choice of therapy. So that, that's all to come. And uh, it, it'll be heavily computer-based. Artificial intelligence will be there. You can't finish a lecture without talking about AI these days, uh, especially in complex decision-making. And we're already seeing that with X-ray interpretation. Mammograms, for example, are interpreted by computer now initially, and the dodgy ones are given to the radiologists, 90% can be just said normal and the computer's picking that up. With this, it's more complex. The computer's, the intelligence algorithm is going to have to work out the, the best way to treat and learn from all the cases it's like. It can do millions of cases all over the world and have that data set. We can't possibly, even the most experienced head and neck oncologist in the world has a limited, uh, a limited Emporia, a limited number of people that they've treated, and that's their cases, and it's biased. It's biased by thing. We're all biased. Um, I'm biased from what I've seen at St. Mary's and Hammersmith. So I've got a, one impression. Someone that's seen it at Sloan Kettering in New York has biased too. He's seen a, he or she's seen a different view of it. So uh, we, we all try and do our best on our past experience, but the future will be using the computer to be a far more balanced nuanced, to use the modern word of the 21st century, uh, view on how best to treat an individual patient. So look, I'll stop there. It's been great talking to you. I really admire what you're doing. I've looked at the program. It's fantastic. And I think you're the future. The idea of having patient groups, patient advisors, not just looking at the technical details, which really, quite frankly, uh, are rather dull. I mean, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, it's rather dull to look at that. But it's, it's how we interpret cancer within society that is really the most important part of the future. So it's been a pleasure joining you. I'm, I'm here for questions, Kevin. Thank you, Carol. Um, lovely to hear from you, as always. Um, now, I know, having attended the conference in Brighton last year myself and previously before, um, that the group is often likes, likes to ask questions. If they don't, I definitely have a question or two for Carol. Um, but right. would anybody like to ask a question or um, would anyone like to raise their hand? Uh, raise a, press the button to raise your hand if you have a question. No one yet? OK, so I, I will I will throw one at you, Carol, um, only because I was I was listening intently when you talked about personalization. Oh, Mita, I will I will I will go to Mita. So Mita, let me uh, turn you off mute so you can actually ask your question. Let me just find the right button to do that. Give me a second. Um, Mita, Mita, there you are. Oh, I think I've muted you. Hang on a second. There you go. Hi, uh, this is uh, this is Sandip, actually. I'm Mita's husband. Um, okay. I've actually been diagnosed with cancer myself. Um, I had two questions. Uh, firstly, right. thank you for the, for the lecture. It's, very, it's been very useful so far. Um, two questions. Uh, the first one is how useful is uh, proton beam radiotherapy uh, in, um, in treating adenocarcinoma? Uh, as that's, I understand, supposed to be less radiosensitive. 
Uh, and the second question is, um, how useful is it uh, to potentially get a genetic profiling of the tumour done uh, yeah. in suggesting treatment options? Sure. Very good questions. And uh, adenocarcinoma is slightly rarer than squamous in the head and neck region, uh, but it is there. And whether protons are of value totally depends on the anatomy around where the cancer is. They may be of value, they may not be of value. It doesn't, it, being squamous or adenocarcinoma, it's true that squamous are more radiosensitive, but most adenocarcinomas are also sensitive. Um, is it, it, which gland is it arising out of? Is it a salivary gland cancer, Mita? Um, it's a, um, it's, so it's nasal, so it's in my, it's from, oh, yeah. Nasal, yeah. but it's also gone into the base of the skull. Uh, That's right. So the nasal cavities and the, the maxillary sinuses are lined by glandular cells, and that's why it's an adenocarcinoma, although you also get squamous cancers there. Uh, no, that would be amenable to proton beam therapy. In terms of, uh, provided it's not spread too far, that's mm -hmm. the other uh, it provides there. The, the other thing is, uh, personalization. Is it worth getting a genetic, a genomic screen? There are several now being uh, advocated. Some of them are good. We're, we're collaborating with a company called OncoDNA. And, you know, at the moment, the NHS is not doing them. They're doing them in breast cancer for a relatively rare indication of something called Oncotype DX. But on the whole, they're not available within the NHS. So it's one of the difficulties. Um, and the cost is about £3,000. The, the other difficulty is you get the results, and what it does, it looks at the molecular anatomy of the cancer in an individual. And then if there's a what we call an actionable mutation, that means there's a mutation in the DNA that can be targeted by a drug, which may not be prescribed normally for that type of cancer. It could be, for example, a drug for lung cancer that is approved. You can actually buy the drug for lung cancer, but in the patient with the, the, the genomic screen, you see that it should work in there. There's the molecular, the same molecular abnormality because, you know, we call this tissue agnostic. It's, it's great to have these sort of religious connotations, but tissue agnostic means you're giving a drug not because it's designed for breast cancer, lung cancer or head and neck cancer, but because you know. Um, you, you know that it's more likely to work because of the molecular abnormality, and that, that's the advantage. The difficulty, of course, is who's going to... Some, some, some of these drugs are quite expensive, uh, like really expensive, like £10,000 a month and so on. And uh, the difficulty for healthcare providers is should they use them when they're not... They're what we call off-label. They're using them in a disease for which there's no... Uh, registrable use and so these are all problems for the future and they're all problems for personalized medicine and my hope is that genomic screening will become routine for everybody not only that it may be possible to do without a biopsy by looking at circulating dna and uh, just by chance it's one of my interests this is a, a, a covid testing kit from saliva and there's a whole new site that we use for all our staff and uh, I've got to do mine this week, it's my turn. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is, and why I'm showing you that, is this is done on saliva samples, looking at DNA, which goes, uh, sorry, virus RNA, obviously, which goes for, for, for screening for COVID. But you could also develop it to look for tumor bits of DNA in saliva which is amazing, and uh, you can pick them up. And maybe that will be a spit test for cancer to diagnose it, and more importantly, a spit test to uh, to actually work out the best possible therapy. I, I'm sorry, it's my granddaughter that's dancing around in the background, <laughs> but I think you get the drift here. Please. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for the thanks for the question. We do have another question Car um, from Karen Baker. Karen, did you want to come on screen or and ask the question, or are you happy for me to just say it? You still there, Karen? Okay, I'll ask. Uh, I'll ask. I'll ask Karen's question for her. Um, Carol said. Karen said. I heard Carol say that you can blast bone with radiation, and it can take it. But doesn't it disintegrate later? A good question, Karen. Uh, you're right. I mean, it depends. When I say blast bone, 
uh, I'm, I'm being a little flippant there. What I mean is you can go to a reasonable dose, a much higher dose than soft tissue, for example, and not get any side effects. So where we see it most in a sarcoma of the leg, a tumor of the leg, a tumor of the bone there, you can really give a high dose up to, you know, double what you'd normally give in the head and neck area, something like 10, uh, you know, 100 gray or something, and the bone will withstand it. And skin with skin is the critical organ when you do that. So bone is very robust in terms of the radiation. And that's probably because it's not gray. Of course, you destroy the bone marrow within the bone. And but provided that's only a small area, it's not going to affect blood production. I mean, if it was a large number of areas of bones, then you would. So on the whole, we get very few problems in the head and neck region where normally people get full dose. They get the equivalent of 60, 60 gray in the 30 treatments, sometimes even higher doses, 70 gray, 80 gray in the States and so on, to try and destroy the tumor. And there we, we really see no bone problem. We see lots of other problems. And giving high doses to the head and neck area is fraught with, with symptoms later, especially towards the very end of the course. And, uh, you know, it's the fifth week problem for everybody. The, the first week is getting used to it and anticipating it. The second week, it's settling in. Third week, side effects really come. Fourth week, side effects get worse. And there's no end in sight. And the fifth week, it just looks, it's, it's dreadful for some patients. They just can't cope and they don't want to come in and they want to give up. And um, we need to make sure that we put their arm around them in a, in a metaphorical sense and make sure whatever the problem is, we're on top of it. If it's mucositis, if it's diarrhea, if it's weight loss, whatever it is, or the dehydration, we have to get on top of it. And uh, by anticipating problems and by having multidisciplinary team doing that, uh, we can improve not only the results, because obviously if people stop radiotherapy halfway through, it's not great, but also the, the, the quality of life during and immediately after radiotherapy. Thank you, Carol. And Karen says thank you as well. Um, we have two more questions. First one is from David and then over to Suzanne. So, David, um, would you like me to ask the question? I think you do. Um, so the question is, could you talk about the changes of treatment of multiple brain mets away from WBRT? And I hope I've read that right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So what, what David means is WBRT is whole brain radiotherapy. So if someone has brain metastasis, in other words, not from a brain tumor, but a lung tumor, a head and neck cancer, breast tumor, you know, all sorts of tumors can give you brain metastasis, prostate cancer. Then the standard treatment in the past was to put people on steroids uh, to reduce the swelling around the cancer. And that usually gives a very good short term response. And then to add whole brain radiotherapy. And but of course, you're radiating the whole brain to a relatively low dose, uh, maybe 10 treatments, um, 20 or 30 gray treatments to the whole brain. But of course, if the tumor is localized into one, one or two sites, we now have technology, uh, relatively simple technology, which allows us to target just those sites and spare the rest of the brain. Now, it's all to do with prognosis. If someone has brain metastasis and a really poor prognosis um, because they've got a lot of metastatic disease, obviously the simplest thing is just to irradiate the whole brain especially if there's multiple metastases in the brain and you know make sure they're comfortable make sure all the quality of life factors are met if on the other hand uh, there's only one or two metastases in the brain and the rest of the body is relatively clear they may have if you get rid of the brain metastasis they may have several years of good quality life and therefore in that circumstance it's worthwhile doing a targeted approach either using uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, which is much more precise radiotherapy just to the metastases, or something called the cyber knife, which does the same thing. It, it, the technical side doesn't really matter. The idea is local, high dose local treatment to get rid of it. The part of the problems with radiotherapy is that we give it over several fractions, the fractionation scheme. And there's no doubt that, you know, if someone hasn't got long to live, it better to have a short fractionation scheme because it's better for them. They need to come once or twice to hospital and then go, go on living. 
Uh, if, on the other hand, you expect them to come for six weeks, five, five days a week, every day, um, there seems no point in a, in a palliative situation if you can speed it up to do it better. So it's all these sort of decisions that have to be put into place to decide what to do. But uh, there are some patients that no longer get whole brain therapy. They get uh, localized treatment for metastases. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, Suzanne, um, who's on camera, I believe, um, had a question as well. Suzanne, would you like to come off mute? They're brilliant. Thank you. Um, hello. Hello, um, Dr. Cora. Um, I'm a, a couple of questions regarding the immunotherapy. Um, in your opinion, are any um, of the currently used immunotherapies, are any uh, proving to be better for head and neck squamous cell carcinomas uh, than others? I'm talking specifically in my case, um, I've had three metastases or three recurrences um, with um, SCC, um, which have been oropharynx and um, and actually nasopharynx, um, all right. being um, positive for HPV-16. Right. Yeah. So uh, basically, th there's not much evidence uh, that, that the different types of immunotherapy have any differential effects. And that's one of the, the problems. They work mm. through a similar mechanism. But drugs such as pembrolizumab and uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab are used in different sequences. Nivolumab is the standard and by far the most commonly used one mm -hmm. uh, in Britain and indeed throughout the world. And it does seem to have quite, a, quite an effect. What we don't understand, we don't have enough data on, is the optimal sequence in which to use them. Um, you know, we don't have a good marker. The, there is this PD1, PDL1, yeah. very complex. I, I, do, do you say you were positive for that? Uh, PDL1, I had a score of um, eight. Right, so that's quite high, yes? Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that suggests you're likely to respond to immunotherapy. And so uh, to, 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 to the drug, to nivolumab, to all these uh, blockers, the immune blockers, and um, there's no doubt that PDL1 is, is a rough estimate. There's almost certainly people that have a low score that would also respond. We just can't pick them up. It's a very crude marker of likely response. So uh, moving forward, that's an area we're going to see a lot of development in. And you know, it shouldn't be, but one of the reasons for wanting it so much is that these drugs are very expensive, as you know. And yeah. if, if we could target them to the right people, we'd get much more effectiveness out of them. The pharma industry just wants to sell drugs, I guess. I hope we're, that we'll get cut off for talking like this. They want to sell drugs, and uh, the the uh, but they they're not interested in in selecting the right patient for the drug. But uh, even to the point, we don't know how long to go on for, and that that is part of the trouble. We just uh, and there must be markers in the cancer cell that would tell you this patient needs six months, this patient needs five years, and something in between. So uh, that's what I see coming. So I mean, you 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 spoke about uh, the need to obviously monitor the effectiveness. Um, on what sort of um, what frequency um, oh. are scans normally used? Uh, the standard is three months, six months, and and then one year is the three, twelve, six, and, and twelve for most things. Um, if we're on an active course of, and because you know the cancers don't sh shrink dramatically usually, you want and patients often know that things are getting better uh, before they have the scan. But usually that's the sort of uh, doing scans every month, for example, is almost certainly wasteful because. Mm. Most head and neck cancers don't change within a month, so you have to wait the three months is up. Yeah, and that would be a PET scan or, or an MRI? Uh, probably an MRI. But, and the important thing is, ideally, you want it on the same, uh, in the same system with the same radiologist reporting, so it's the comparison scans. And uh, again, the computers are very good. They allow you to calculate the, the volume of a tumour, the dimension of the volume, and then move to the next scan. I see. I see. You mentioned nivolumab. Um, I wasn't offered nivolumab. In fact, I was offered 
Pembrolizumab. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, that's the that's the more the common one for certain types. What sort of tumor do you have? Which 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 site is it, Suzanne? If you don't well, mind. It, it orig originally it was a tonsil cancer. Right. Um, right. And then um, it suddenly, after seven years, it transferred to the nasopharynx. Right. In, in, in fact, as high up as the base of my skull. Right. And then. And and then I got a, um, a met some more mets in my neck, and then right. now it seems that it's it's hovering in the base of my tongue, but it's not actually at the moment. It doesn't seem to be a solid tumor. It seems to be in the lymph nodes and in the right. blood. Right. Well, you know, and how how much pembrolizumab have you had? I've had just up to now. Just I, I started just six weeks ago, oh, so right. I've had oh, right. two, so two, two sessions. Do. Yeah. Yes, yeah. only two sessions. Well, good luck. I hope it responds. That would be good. At the moment, I don't have side effects, um, essentially, but um, obviously very early days, as I've only had right. two two lots um, at, at three, week, three weekly intervals. Right. OK. No, that's good. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, is there anybody else? Last call for any other questions? Same. Same type of scanning. That's no, no more questions. Um, OK, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Carol Sikor for his time today. Um, thank you, Carol, as ever. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining. We know time is precious. And